Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God brooded upon the face of the waters. And the Lord God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness, and the evening and the morning became the first day. Genesis chapter 1. My friends, welcome to an audio podcast of Book and Spade. The verses that we have just heard come from the very opening of time itself. The work that we call Genesis propels us into the author's heart, into the heart of God. For we see here the repetition of a Hebrew word that appears rarely in Scripture, bara. It means to create out of nothing. The philosophers call this ex nihilo. And we see here how God speaks creation into existence. We see here how there is the spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, which broods upon the face of the waters, the primordial Tachon, the, primor- the primordial deep. And it's interesting that the word Tachon here, used in this passage, is the very word that is used for the underworld, Hades, Tartarus. And so the Spirit of God broods upon that which is formless, that which is dangerous, that which is perilous, that which appears to be most threatening. And yet out of sheer disaster, out of what appears to be utter abyss, there comes light. The British author John Ronald Rule Tolkien coined an interesting word with Clive Staples Lewis. It is called eucatastrophe. And the idea is simple. We think of catastrophe many times, a sudden shift from good to bad, from a state of paradise to paradise lost. But the story of salvation is not merely the story of paradise lost. It is the story of paradise regained. It is fascinating to note that after this bara, this new creation, God establishes the right order of the heavens and of the earth, the sea, the land, and all that is in them. And that in all of creation, we see the participation of this Elohim. Elohim, as any student of Hebrew will know, is used uniquely here because the term is clearly referring to Yahweh, the creator of heaven and of earth, God himself. And yet the term Elohim has a plural ending. A perfect example can be found with the word for one of the highest ranks of angels, a seraph or cherub. If we say that, it's used singularly. If we add an IME ending to it, as in cherubim or seraphim, we instantly know, instinctually even, that we are dealing with a plurality, many. And yet... What is so beautiful and fascinating about this Elohim is that though it has a plural conclusion, it in fact is used singularly. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Lord God said, right. So what we have here is an image of a plural term being used in the singular. Why is this interesting? We already see from the first verse of the Bible a glimpse 
into the heart and mind of the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why God later on will use the plural when he says, Let us make man in our image and in our own likeness. And so we see that the Spirit, the Ruach Elohim, was there even from the beginning, over the face of the waters. He, the uncreated, everlasting God, consubstantial with both the Father and the Son, was there before time and participated in the fashioning of all things with the Father and the Son. It is also quite unique and beautiful to note that at the Tower of of Babel, when mankind warred against all of humanity's God, creator, and Lord. This confusion of tongues that we see, this confusion of languages that we see in Genesis chapter 11, the spilling forth of the peoples, we see it reversed, don't we? When in Acts chapter 2, the spirit, the Ruach Elohim, descends in tongues of fire upon the twelve apostles. And so they are able to speak to all the citizens, visitors and pilgrims in Jerusalem, so that they hear, as it, as it were, in one voice, the living voice of the Ruach Elohim, the Ruach HaKodesh, the breath of Adonai, God. This miracle indicates a clash between two kingdoms, doesn't it? The kingdom led by the Ruach HaKodesh, the kingdom led by he who unites, he who creates out of nothing, he who inspires every artist, every musician, every poet, every painter, in the good, the true, and the beautiful, he who moved upon the face of the waters, descended in the form of a dove upon God the Son in the river Jordan. And the opposites of Pentecost, Shavuot in Hebrew. What is that opposite? That Babel event, when man and woman decided to raise a tower to the heavens, to build a ziggurat in pride, to create some kind of portal or door, thinking that they could somehow transcend their humanity to become God, is witnessed in this culture with deep confusion as to the identity of man and the identity of woman, with deep confusion in regards to the nature of who God is and who the creation is, blurring the distinction between the creator and, and the creature. We see this deeply with the rise of great division. The word diabolic, diopolin, literally could be translated to tear or rend apart. And yet what we see here, miraculously, with the descent of the third person of the Trinity, when he, the author of all of creation, when he descends upon the twelve, we see one of the greatest occurrences of an explosion of grace, the likes of which we have seldom seen before. What do I mean? If you were a betting or gambling man or woman and you wanted to ask yourselves, is it likely that this early movement in Judea is to spread throughout the entire world? Is it likely that these 12 men and the 120 something people in that upper room are going to survive another week or two? If you were looking at the math and only the statistics, you would have shaken your head and said no. The Jewish authorities were out to murder them. The Roman authorities would eventually come to murder all of them except for John. To be a Christian, to proclaim Jesu Kyrios, Jesus is Lord, rather than Caesare Kyrios, Caesar is Lord, 
was to the minds of many in the early church a decision which meant martyrdom, which meant the laying low of life. And yet they chose this. You would assume that such a movement built upon the deaths of the young and of the old who went to their sometimes gruesome ends, singing hymns and psalms of praise to Yahweh, would be a colossal failure. And yet, within only 30 to 40 years, Christianity has spread to Antioch, throughout Asia Minor. Shaul, Paul of Tarsus, will bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus, even to the doors of Greece and into Rome, along with Caiapha, Peter. And we witness 300 years, the year 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea, in which finally the very empire which had sought to stamp out this flame of grace, the very empire which sought to smother the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Jesu Christus, now at last stands in agreement regarding the creed. The Edict of Milan, I believe 311 AD, establishes the religion as tolerated within the empire. And later on, I believe it is Theodosius, not Constantine, who makes it the official faith of the empire. So the very institution that sought to crush and kill the apostolic ministry and which successfully murdered 11 of the 12 apostles could not quench the fire of the Holy Spirit could not destroy the unifying flame that undoes the division and darkness of Babel. There are many in this present culture who are tempted, and justifiably so, to have a chicken little response to the darkness of our present age. They tend to look at the evil within the church. They tend to look at the evil that is in society. The brainwashing of little ones, the harassment of clergy who faithfully serve their office. The totalitarianist measures made at times against the body of Christ. And their response can be, the sky is falling. But lest we forget that our God is the God of Yesharon, as we read in Deuteronomy 33, who rideth upon the clouds. Lest we forget that our God is indeed the same loving Abba, who has his arms open wide to receive us prodigals. Lest we forget that we ourselves this day, this day, are filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit that is holy, let us recognize that we have never been of this world though we are in it. St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, states, Be ye not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He says elsewhere, I believe it is in Corinthians, that we walk by faith and not by sight. In Hebrews 11 we read, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. I think of the prophet Elijah, Eliyahu, who after the great contest on Mount Carmel, a man led of the Spirit, 1 Kings chapters 17 through 19, I believe, 
is running away from Queen Jezebel. He's fleeing. He has seen the fire of God descend and eat up a carcass. He has witnessed the slaughter of the 450 false prophets of Baal, and yet this messenger of God is fleeing. Once again, he's seeing the odds, he's seeing the math, he's seeing the statistics. I am one man. She has entire armies. What am I supposed to do? God leads him back to Mount Sinai. Back to the place of the Old Covenant. In Exodus chapter 20, we see the giving of the covenant at the first Pentecost in the Feast of Shavuot, where God proclaims out of the great cloud, the Ten Commandments, and he cries out to God for a sign. And the word of the Lord says to the prophet Elijah, Why are you here, Elijah? And his response, if my memory serves me, is, Lord, they have torn down your altars and killed all your prophets, and I alone am left and they seek to take my life. He's commanded to go out to the mouth of the cave where he is staying on Mount Horeb, on Mount Sinai. And those who know scripture best will remember the story. The historical eyewitness narrative. There is a great fire, but God is not in the fire. There is a great hurricane which rends the rocks, but God is not in the hurricane. There's a great earthquake, but God is not in the great earthquake. Then the voice of God, the voice says to Elijah, the fullness of his mission, the fullness of his design, and it arrives not with thunder or cloud or strokes of lightning like we saw in Exodus 20 in the first Shavuot, but in a still, small voice. In a still, small voice. Here I will speak plainly as a Roman Catholic who carries out the practice of Eucharistic adoration. This is the practice of kneeling before the consecrated host in the tabernacle, So the bread and the wine consecrated that become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And in the process of adoration, we kneel before God in silence and meditate upon the mystery of his real presence. We seek God in that still, small voice. We seek the Father in his still, small voice. And yes, we seek the Spirit in his still voice small voice. Now for our Protestant listeners who are also with us, I would add, it is very clear that you also probably encounter this in Scripture. Rarely does it occur in the life of the Christian day by day, reading the Holy Bible, studying Scripture as authoritative and inerrant, that God opens up a hole in the ceiling or throws thunderbolts down. He does do this. And we do see miracles, and his gifts are for today, but this is no longer usually day by day, at least in the ordinary form, the way we encounter him. Once again, please understand, I am not denying the fact that extraordinary things do happen. I have witnessed extraordinary things myself. But in the day to day, where do we hear him in in scripture? When that one verse from the Holy Bible, when that one verse from the inerrant word of God, touches our hearts. And we hear the Spirit. We hear him, the Ruach HaKodesh, in that still, small voice. I would invite you, each and every one of you, this Shavuot, this Pentecost, to say with King David in Psalm 51, Create me a clean heart, O God, And renew your steadfast spirit within me. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. 
The word create there is that same word from Genesis 1, bara, to create out of nothing. In Ezekiel 36, God promises you and me that he will remove a heart of stone and give us a new heart of flesh and place his ruach, his spirit within us, that we might obey his law, his, his precepts, his covenant. We read quite plainly in Scripture how the Holy Spirit descends when Christ is in the River Jordan. For the first Yehoshua, for the first Joshua, in that ancient book of the Old Testament, the waters parted for the children of Israel. When he was God incarnate, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Jesus enters the River Jordan, the Spirit of God descends, and it is not the waters which part, it's the heavens which part. And the voice of the Father says, as we read in Mark 1, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. My friends, there are two voices that are often with us. There is the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the world, which by the world we mean the fallen order of creation. The world, the creation itself was made for grace, for glory, but it is, of course, fallen through Adam, awaiting, as we read in Romans 8, the day of consummation, the restoration of all things. And it is unique. It is beautiful to know. In Romans 8, that opening verse, if God be with us, who can be against us? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This revelation is that Christ, the Spirit, and the Father see us, prodigal children though we are, with the very words that the Father speaks to the Son in Mark 1. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Or if you are a woman listening to this, you are my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. God looking upon you with the eyes of love. His arms open wide upon the cross. The Spirit, He standing there, leading you. The Father whispering to your heart, leading you home. What is the voice of this fallen order of creation? Where do we see it most active? What is the word for Satan in Hebrew, if not Hashatan? Hashatan, the accuser. The prosecuting attorney. We see in the book of Zechariah how Hashatan stands to the side of Yehoshua, the high priest, to accuse him of his sins. We see in the book of Job, chapter 1, how Hashatan goes to Yorhei Vavchei to accuse. Now, don't get me wrong, there is time to call out sin for sin. There is time for, of course, the Holy Spirit to convict us, as we read in the Gospel of John, but it is a conviction which leads to healing to salve us, to wholeness. It is a conviction that leads to love and to communion with divine love. It is a leading back, a metanoia, a turning away from our old life to a new, to be a new creation. It is the voice of the hashitan, the voice of the accuser, which leads not to a turning away, but to a denial of our God-given baptismal status as royal sons and royal daughters of God, to see us as to see ourselves as either lesser than we are, or to mistake ourselves for something more beyond our gift as a royal son or royal daughter. God wants, however, to give us so much more than we could ever imagine. And his blessing and his provision is with us through his Ruach, he who is equally, consubstantially God, the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And why do I say this? Because in Revelation 22, 
The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Then him who is athirst, come to the water. And come. There is this sense where God is leading us back into the primordial garden. Back in Revelation 22 to the tree of life, the citadel restored. The visage of the city of white. We ourselves are summoned back to the arms of a loving Abba, Yeshua, Ruach Elohim, who are waiting for us, one God and three persons, who are waiting for us, who is waiting for us. If only we would, like Elijah, hear him in his still small voice. In this episode for Pentecost, therefore I wish to end with a, a small prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle us with the fire of your divine love. Inspire us with discernment. Inspire us with your creativity. Inspire us with your wisdom. Inspire us with your grace. Come, Holy Spirit, and do not allow us to fall gravely away from your love, but help us to be living vessels like the Blessed Virgin Mary, as living tabernacles and bearers of the divine name, which is equally your name, yod heh vav heh I am that I am. That we might declare the wisdom that is in Christ Jesus, who teaches us to deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow you, and discover the mystery of the kingdom. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would descend on everyone listening to this. And if there are any illnesses that you, in your will, and in the Father's will, and in the Son's will, wish to heal, that they may be healed. I ask fervently that if there are any among those listening who are chained and heavy burdened, that you, with the Son and with the Father, would give them rest and ease from toil I ask that you would inspire them also when the time is right and the season is appointed for them to carry out the glorious work that you, the Son, and the Father have appointed for them before the foundations of the world. Come, Holy Spirit, I humbly implore you, not by my will but by thine, that you would remind us of who we are in you and in the Father and in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, that the will that you have for us, which is life and life more abundantly, might be made manifest to the world, that they might believe. We ask all these blessings through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord. Amen. We look forward to hearing from you soon. We hope you have a beautiful Pentecost. May God richly bless you all. Well.